Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining me as usual is Martin Patella, the health coach at lifeenthusiast.com. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you for asking, the Life Enthusiast in full force. Uh, today, I wanted to point out a little bit more about me as the life enthusiast because long before I became life enthusiast, I became a sick man. I was very sick with what these days is known as fibromyalgia, but it was really a generalized chronic inflammatory health condition. There is a huge range of symptoms. Uh, in my case, it had to do with migraines and back pains and plantar fasciitis and uh, and other collapsing physical parts of my body. But later it actually evolved into becoming hypersensitized and into brain fog and who knows what else. And it took me several years to figure out what was going on. And in parallel, I was actually studying to be a hypnotherapist. So I was getting a lot of training. I was trained as a clinical hypnotherapist. I was working on people uh, smoking cessation and weight loss and trauma and who knows what else. But eventually I found my way into uh, the physical health when in 2001 we finally launched the Life Enthusiast as you know it today. Just in the way of background, so you understand that I'm not just speaking out of turn or not understanding what goes into this picture. Right. And so in continuing that theme for today, what we're going to be looking at is the brain, because obviously when we experience anything, it's happening in our brain. You know, if you take a hammer and you bang on your thumb, your thumb says, hey, brain, I'm sore. And what happens when the brain isn't quite working the way it should be? And that's uh, that's the big question. So our guest today is Ashok Gupta. And he personally suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome for around three years. So he also knows what it's like to have these conditions that everyone says, you look fine. I don't understand why you just don't get up and run around the block. And uh, he's, he found ways that he could become 100% recovered. And we're really excited to, to have him on the show today because he has a slightly different take on fibromyalgia and a lot of these chronic conditions that we're suffering from in today's society. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and thank you, Martin. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. I'm very pleased to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in all this stuff? Yeah, so when I was uh, at university, I basically suffered from the condition myself, as you mentioned. So some people call it chronic fatigue syndrome. Some people know it as ME but obviously has a lot of crossovers with fibromyalgia as well. And I had it for a few years and I had a lot of research, like a lot of people do when you're feeling ill, you don't know where to turn. And I did a lot of research into the brain neurology of illnesses, the brain neurology of emotion, and realized that actually traditional medicine was splitting psychology and some aspects of the brain in one area, and then physiology and physical um, brain abnormalities in a separate area. But what I want to do is marry the two areas of research and say, actually, there is a perfectly reasonable and logical explanation for a lot of what was happening to me at that time. I then used that information to publish a medical paper and also get myself fully well. And, you know, it's an incredible journey. And from then on, I've been um, working with uh, many patients around the world to help them get better as well from uh, CFS and fibromyalgia, and also uh, multiple chemical sensitivities. So that's how I uh, first got involved. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, when someone says fibromyalgia, what does that mean for you? Because I find that we have a lot, of, we have over 35,000 people in our fibromyalgia support group. And uh, oftentimes it's, ah, oh, you know, I have a migraine headache. Is that a symptom of fibromyalgia? And so half the time we're trying to really figure out if we have the label, and I, I would tell everybody, look, if you're in pain and you're not performing the way you know you should be, you have some sort of chronic problem and let's deal with that. And let's not worry about the labels. But having said that, when, when someone talks to you about fibromyalgia, what, what does that sort of bring up? Just so we all have the sort of the same idea here. So I see all of these different conditions as a spectrum. 
and they're very much connected. So if someone says they have fibromyalgia, they have fibromyalgia versus chronic fatigue syndrome versus something else, simply because of a, a very arbitrary set of criteria that they actually meet. So if you meet four out of the six, great. If you meet three out of the six, then you don't technically have fibromyalgia. And this is, unfortunately, the way people are being diagnosed. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. For me, fibromyalgia is a condition where if you've been to your doctor and they've ruled out all other reasonable explanations for your condition and you have these set of symptoms, then the fibromyalgia is more likely to, be, to include symptoms of pain, of unexplained pain. And that pain needs to be widespread across the body. And there may well be secondary conditions like migraines, irritable bowel, sleep problems, et cetera, which are all part of that mix. But for me, I suppose the, one of the primary uh, symptomatologies is the kind of widespread pain that people are experiencing. If they don't have the widespread pain, but they have all the other symptoms, then potentially um, I would probably put them in the chronic fatigue syndrome box. But as I said, all of these are overlapping conditions of a spectrum. So it's very difficult to formally diagnose. I like the idea of the box. When you were talking, I had a, a sandbox, right? And it's kind of like you go in that corner over there and you go in that corner over there, but you're all still in the box, right? Yes. And it, if you don't do something about it, it's only going to get worse, right? Like it's not, there's very few people I know that say, well, I, you know, I had chronic fatigue syndrome and it kind of stayed the same for 20 years. And it's usually now, now I have pain and now I have irritable bowel syndrome and now I have this. And, it just keeps piling on. Uh, yeah, and, and for me, the reason for that is once our nervous system, our immune system and our defensive systems don't have a break on them anymore, they then go into overdrive and they can cause all kinds of secondary symptoms. So people find that one symptom goes, but a new symptom comes along and they just can't seem to explain that. And actually from my hypothesis, it's, it's a very obvious explanation Every single system and organ in the body can create a malfunction if it is overstimulated and therefore symptoms can come and go. You must have heard our last talk because it was all about how to get into that relaxation and let the body actually recover as opposed to, you know, and, as, and recover. And of course, everyone says, oh, I had, you know, 10 hours of sleep. Yeah, but you didn't have 10 hours of good sleep, so mm -hmm. your body didn't have a chance to recover. And... So what are some of the things that cause fibromyalgia in your opinion? Okay, so in terms of the causes of these conditions, I always take a step back and say, and ask the biggest question of all, which is, you know, why are we here? <laughs> so we can obviously answer that from a philosophical perspective in terms of what is the meaning of life. But we can also well, look at it from a side. I can interrupt for a second. We are not here to have fibromyalgia. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely true. We're definitely not here to, uh, to be ill. And in fact, I use this phrase, our birthright is to be healthy and happy. And therefore, there are definitely mechanisms that we can get that. So we asked the biggest question of all, why are we here from a scientific perspective? And over millions of years of evolution, um, our nervous systems have developed and our health has developed and our defensive systems have developed to be able to protect us from danger. Now, some of those defensive systems can sometimes, in my view, over-defend the system. Yeah. So if I give an analogy of, let's say, a castle, and let's imagine that the army of that castle is defending the castle against danger. So if there's, for example, an invading army of a particular virus or bacteria, then the army gets engaged and starts fighting off the army. So they keep fighting, they keep fighting, they keep fighting, now, if a person is in a weakened state, so let's say, as an example, they have flu, or let's say, in the case of fibromyalgia, often it's triggered by a localized pain condition. If the person is going through a lot of chronic stress or acute stress, those, that army literally gets traumatized, where it thinks, I am so worried that we aren't going to be able to make this castle survive, that I must now over-defend the castle. So they fight off the army, but they are now on guard. And if a little, one soldier comes over the hill, they think, oh no, we're being invaded again. And they go out and the whole army goes out and tries to defend the castle. Fast forward many years, or not even many years, many months. And then what happens is that army has become traumatized. And it's traumatized to over-defending the castle 
even if they see a little girl coming over the hill, they'll think, aha, this is dangerous. We, we have to defend because we nearly lost the castle last time. And so the whole body, the army of the body, defensive systems, go into overdrive. And in the case of chronic fatigue syndrome and, and ME, the overdrive system is more around the immune system. In fibromyalgia, the defensive system is the pain networks. The, when we have pain, it is a signal to our brain that something needs to change or we're in danger. If those pain signals then become hyper aroused, then those very symptoms from the body, the, the signals of pain, come up through the brain, get magnified um, into the brain, into the thalamus, the sensory cortex, the amygdala, the insula. And those pain signals, when become magnified, then start triggering more defensive response. So we start triggering aspects of the immune system. We start triggering aspects of the nervous system. We start triggering uh, neuropathic fibers at a localized level to start magnifying and inflaming the body. So we know there's more inflammation in the body and inflammation in the brain. That inflammation then causes pain and the buildup of lactic acid causes pain. And the sensory fibers, which are now becoming disrupted and magnified, start causing pain. Those signals of pain come back into the brain and the brain thinks, oh no, I'm in danger. Like that army starts seeing a person coming over the hill thinking, I'm in danger. These signals represent danger. Right, I must overstimulate all of these different defensive systems. It then overstimulates and we get caught in a cycle of the brain protecting the body. By protecting the body, it's causing the very symptoms that then feed back to the brain and indicate to the brain that we are in danger. That then creates more stimulation and we get caught in this vicious cycle. The brain and the body reacting to each other continually. And so the core conditioning that has occurred, I believe, is in the insular part of the brain and the amygdala. And we know that in fibromyalgia and a lot of the brain studies, the insular part of the brain is shown to be malfunctioning in some way. In a lot of people's brains, it shrinks but becomes hyperactive. So I believe that the insular part of the brain can no longer handle the amount of stimulation and the amount of signals that it's getting from the body. It feels overwhelmed and it becomes inflamed and therefore can no longer moderate and put the brakes on the nervous system and the immune system and pain networks. The amygdala as well probably becomes part of that system that then starts overstimulating not only emotional responses, but also uh, uh, neuropathic and also um, uh, the nervous system, so the fight or flight response, defensive responses. So, I mean, there's lots of things around that particular uh, hypothesis, but that's it in a nutshell. And I'll just add that then once you have your system hyper aroused, and remember that system is only supposed to be aroused for a few minutes at a time, but if it's being aroused chronically for weeks or months or years, it can cause secondary systems to also malfunction. So we might have thyroid problems, we may have irritable bowel, we may have adrenal exhaustion, mitochondria dysfunction, uh, allergy, sensitivities, the whole range of secondary conditions which then also contribute to symptoms. And the core of it is when the brain is in defensive mode, it will not allow us to have restorative sleep. This is the key thing. So at night, when you're going to sleep, the brain is saying, hang on, why are you trying to go to sleep? There is danger. We are in danger. You need to pay attention to the pain signals from your body. Therefore, the amygdala says, I will not allow you to have the deep restorative sleep because I want you to keep awake and figure out a solution to what we're going through. And we know in sleep studies that when people can't sleep very well, their amygdalas are hyperactivated during the night. And we also know that in the average population, if you don't have deep restorative sleep, you will have more pain in the body and in the, in the joints the next day. But imagine a sufferer, you're having this continually for weeks or months. It's obvious then that we're gonna have a lot of pain signals in the body um, and each set of symptoms will vary from person to person as well. Oh. I have, uh, as you're describing it, I'm having these vivid images in my mind of a pit bull terrier who has been mistrained by its owner to be mm. hyper reactive and it just responds incorrectly in a social situation instead of just 
saying, I'm fine, we're fine, no danger. I'm just on a stroll through the park with my owner. Instead, yeah. this dog just barks and lunges at everything. Right, exactly. And that's exactly. Of been trained. It's, yeah. yeah, for fear. Essentially, it's a fear that has yeah. become embedded into the loop. And, and I mean, you explained it exceedingly well with this uh, insomnia. That's the number one triggering symptoms that symptom or cause of symptom that I know of is that yeah. when people don't restore, then it just piles on itself and it escalates and escalates and escalates. And then finally comes some liminal triggering event, the last mm. straw and bang, people go from functioning to completely disabled. Exactly. And the reason that, that you just described there, how it can be up and down, the reason I think this hypothesis works well is because people do have good days and bad days. If you have an illness, if you break your leg, your leg is broken regardless of how you might feel or what's happened that day. But in fibromyalgia and all of these different conditions, you'll have good days, bad days, good weeks, bad weeks. And that is the strength of the vicious cycle. So if the body and the brain are not responding so much to each other, then the cycle will be quite slow. But if they are chronically responding to each other, they'll become so fast that they will use up all the energy, all the neurotransmitters, all of the hormones, to the, po the point at which someone is so exhausted they can't move. So the severity of symptoms is down to the severity of the vicious cycle that is going on unconsciously in the brain. So, so patients aren't responsible for this. It is something that is very unconscious and we normally have no control over whatsoever. I think that's a really good point because one of the other things that comes up in the group all the time is I feel so guilty I haven't been able to do the dishes. I feel so guilty because I couldn't go out to see my mom. I feel so guilty because, because, because. And it's and I think what you just said was really important. Like it's it's not a conscious thing that's going on. It's it's in the subconscious and in the unconscious. And so that's kind of where we need to deal with it and let go of the guilt because actually based on what you just said, all these guilty thoughts and beating myself up for this stuff is going to make it worse, not better. Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. It's about removing any sense of fault or guilt. And I do notice people tend to be quite hard on themselves. And the kinds of people who get these conditions, they do tend to be, you know, they have high expectations on themselves and they're hard on themselves. And there's, there's sometimes a kind of sense of a lack of compassion for themselves. And I always say to people, this is a real physical illness with real physical symptoms. You have no reason to feel that you are at fault. It's happened completely automatically unconsciously. And actually, the, the, I try and reverse it and say, you are an evolutionary more advanced being because your system has decided to ensure your survival and protect you from these dangers. The issue is that your protective mechanisms have just got into overdrive because, and this is the most important thing, your brain cares more about your survival than it does necessarily um, homeostasis. Survival is the number one priority, which makes completely se complete sense from an evolutionary point of view. It's just that that system gets stuck in that hyper survival mode and doesn't enable us to feel healthy and strong in our own bodies. So this is simply a, a defense system which is overprotecting. Yeah. And so what I, what I hear I, you say here is that we have a responsibility to realize that this is so. So even though we didn't have any volitional choices about how this came about, or we got into this hole, we fell into it through not knowing. But yeah. now that we know, we do have a choice to make. And the choice is, do we want to repair this brain injury or not? Exactly. So it's happened without us knowing. And normally, until medicine comes along and is able to open up our brain, fix some of the neurons and close it back up, until that <laughs> technology comes, the only way that we can influence those subconscious defensive responses is through our prefrontal cortex. So our prefrontal cortex is a rational thinking mind. And normally, it doesn't have a way of necessarily directly controlling those subconscious responses. But through very specific types of brain retraining, we can convince the brain that we are no longer in physical danger. And the symptoms in the body no longer represent a threat to homeostasis or a threat to survival. And when we convince the 
unconscious brain that we are no longer in survival mode and it's not required, then it will switch off defensive responses and the body comes back to homeostasis. And this is what I always say, this condition is an issue of the software, not the hardware. So the hardware, the physical body, may have some temporary problems that we need to fix. The muscles may atrophy, the muscles may become um, uh, you know, tight, but those are temporary issues. Once the software is fixed, then the hardware comes back to normal. And traditional medicine is very good at fixing the hardware, but it doesn't know how to deal with software conditions. So fibromyalgia, CFS, chemical sensitivities, irritable bowel, myofascial pain, etc., cetera, are, are illnesses where software has got into trouble rather than, and, and is affecting the hardware. Yeah. So you've talked, uh, you've put together a really good uh, outline of where we were and where we can go. Now the question in my mind is how do we get there? Like how do we change that software? Okay. So I believe there are two ways, two supporting ways that help us retrain the brain. So we talk about retraining the intellect part of the brain and retraining the amygdala part of the brain. And if you think about it, survival instincts and survival responses are very hardwired. They become very hardwired in the brain when we learn this conditioning. So we're not gonna be able to shut it off. I mean, I wish I, I could tell my clients to say, hey brain, switch off defensive responses because we're safe now. It doesn't work like that. You know, the, the unconscious is like a seven-year-old child, right? So if you tell a seven-year-old child who's frightened, hey, stop crying, everything's going to be fine. That seven-year-old child isn't going to listen the first time. But, and if you shout at that child, it becomes even more upset. So the more we upset and annoyed we get at ourselves and our brains, the worse it gets. We have to learn to speak compassionately and lovingly to our brain. And the way that we do that is to communicate with it in a certain way to say, hey, I know you think we're in danger, but actually we're not. And this is why, and this is how. So um, what we have in our program is a specific way that we've spent many years refining, what we call a seven-step process of retraining, that step by step, each step retrains and configures the neural networks to let go of defensive responses. So that's one way, which is this specific brain retraining. And to support that, we have uh, meditation or deep relaxation techniques. And what the meditation and deep re relaxation do is they support retraining. So we know that the brain is more neuroplastic and more rewirable when it is in a more calm, happy state. When the brain is in a traumatized state, a fear state, a worried state, which is a lot of, a lot of the states that people experience day to day, it becomes locked and fixed because logically that's what the brain should do if it's in a fear mode. But when we calm down the brain at a general level, the brain then says, we open up a window to say, perhaps we're not in such danger because now we've calmed down. Perhaps there's a new way of looking at things. Maybe we can get out of survival mode. So the two core processes are brain retraining and, and, um, and relaxation, uh, and, sorry, deep meditation to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. When we move from sympathetic activity, which is stress and, and all those things, to parasympathetic mode, when we correct the vagus nerve, which, is, uh, which innovates the parasympathetics, then the system can gradually come back to normal. So I often find that when the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, people feel better quite quick, you know, relatively quickly, but then we need the sleep systems and cycles to restore, the detoxification systems to come back to normal, the muscles to heal, and that may take a bit of time. So we need sustained parasympathetic activity for homeostasis to, to come back to balance. The reason the brain retraining is important is because if the brain has a period of parasympathetic activity but still believes we're in danger from minor signals, it will go back into defense mode. So the brain needs to be deeply convinced that we are safe. Cool. So tell us a little bit about your program. I understand that you do live workshops and also you've got a DVD program. Yes, that's right. So we, the, the core of our program is a home study course, which is a DVD program with audio CDs and uh, obviously DVDs and a workbook. And we combine that with three months of coaching because what we found was we were just offering the home pack by itself. 
But people kind of felt like they were being left on their own. So we said, okay, we want to help people. So it's now combined with 12 weeks of coaching in a group so that each week people know exactly what they need to achieve or need to do. And they've got questions or worries and they can bring them and then I will answer those questions. So it's a three month series of um, uh, webinars combined with a home study course. And we also have a, a very active Facebook forum. So there's a, a very supportive, loving environment where people can get support through that. And people have actually found they've recovered better because other people have given them advice and helped them through it. So we've got a really loving community uh, which really supports, which is great. And we also do live workshops. So I was in the US doing some this year. Uh, we've had one in London, and I'll also be coming to the US, perhaps Canada, uh, to deliver some live workshops as well this year. Is it always yourself doing it, or do you have other trainers? We have other people. So we have about, uh, we're training up more people. So we have about 15 to 20 coaches all around the world, including in the US. We're training hopefully one in Canada. And these coaches can see people one on one. So I deliver the workshops and the webinars, but the some people need one on one support. So we have fantastic coaches who tailor it to an individual. Well, okay. all I have to say is uh, you sound like Martin's twin brother. Right. <laughs> Yesterday, everything you said was a different, uh, slightly different angle, but the parasympathetic and the sympathetic was a lot of what we talked to uh, with the group on uh, Facebook Live yesterday. It was, a, it was great to hear it. And, and I think it's important to hear it from different people in different ways because mm -hmm. you can hear something from me and oh, I don't understand. And then you hear it from Martin or yourself and it's like, oh, now it makes sense. So I think this is a really important message. To, to further yeah. explain to further explain what Scott's trying to say is we have taken the approach mainly through nutrition and and nutritional support because there are of course ways to activate the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, through metabolic typing it teaches you to understand which foods or combinations of foods and which minerals will activate in you the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. And this varies, and most, most the mainstream medical system doesn't understand it or ignores it at its own peril, mm -hmm. where nutrition can indeed send you into a sympathetic flare or parasympathetic flare. And of course, if you over, overdo parasympathetic, you become depressed. If you overdo uh, sympathetic, you become ragey and angry and impossible. Yeah, it and I, I agree with you there. So in our system as well, we have a supportive nutritional um, program, which is all about a healthy diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, which is very important because we're already getting inflamed. So the last thing we want to do is eat more foods which inflame us. So we talk about an anti-inflammatory diet with supporting nutrients. Um, now, in terms of specific supplements, we don't necessarily say the specific supplements that people need. We say if, we, if people go out there and they find things that help them and support them, that's great. Generally, we find for the vast majority of people, if they do the retraining and they're eating a good diet with some, some nice uh, nutrients, making sure they're getting their vitamin D and their omega-3 and all those kinds of things, then the, the direct retraining is uh, you know, very powerful at being able to switch off the, the sympathetics in short periods of time. Yes, indeed. We have found that some foods and some supplements are universally applicable to this. We have, yeah. uh, especially the cannabidiol extract of hemp has been very good at soothing the overstimulated nervous system. Right. Uh, magnesium and potassium yeah. Yeah. tend to be parasympathizing, as are green things, chlorophyll-rich foods. Right. Absolutely. And we're finding uh, turmeric and ginger uh, getting a lot of positive feedback on turmeric as well. So we know that turmeric and olive oil are two of nature's massive anti-inflammatories, which uh, we encourage everyone to take, and coconut oil as well. Indeed. Yeah. Good point. So, OK, so about delivery of this system, we need to get our clients to get the idea that, yes, we understand that there is a brain injury component to this that cannot easily be reached with drugs. In fact, they cannot be reached with drugs. Chemicals do not apply. Uh, nutrients will support you in developing better 
uh, at the peripheral level. You, there are specific nutrients that help the brain. I believe that would be like lecithin, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, uh, thing, EL, ALA, the lipoic acid, and so on. But still, even in a well-nourished brain, we still have this wrong software. Exactly. I mean, those particular supplements, probably how they're helping is because of the overstimulation, those nutrients um, become lower. They get uh, used up very quickly. So we are, those probably replenish. But ultimately, what, they may not necessarily be stopping the, the cause of why they got um, used up in the first place. So I think the brain retraining aspect is, is for me, the, re- the most important. And I think what's important is um, people having this sense of belief that they can get better from this because there's so many negative forums out there, but it, it obviously sounds like the, the, you know, life enthusiasts is a very positive and supportive environment, which is, which is great. And um, what we're most focused on is, is research. So we have done a few studies. So we did a study at our own clinic, uh, which was a clinical audit, which found that around two thirds of patients reached 80 to 100% recovery within a year. And we've recently done a study on fibromyalgia in Spain, which is very interesting. So we had a control group that had no, actually got worse after the uh, six months. But then in the active group that was doing our treatment, uh, we found out of 21 patients, uh, five or six patients didn't engage with the treatment. But the 16 patients that did engage, eight patients actually went on to make a full recovery, which we call an 80 to 100% recovery. And eight patients made a 50 to 60% recovery. And that was not necessarily with any nutritional supplements. That was simply uh, brain retraining and some of the supportive processes and uh, generally good diet. So that study will be published in in the pain uh, journal uh, relatively soon. And that will hopefully spark more interest in what we're doing with fibro patients. So I think the research side for us is is very important. And we're looking to raise about $200,000 for a, a large scale trial in the U.S., I really appreciate what you're saying here from two perspectives. The one is that you're not promising it's a seven day trick. It's, it's a six month program and it's gradual and you have to work for it. And if you don't do it, then you fall back. You have to work it off. There is no uh, magic button, you work it. And you retrain it and after you've retrained it, you will get better. And the, that's great to me. Um, not a quick fix. Yeah, it's not a quick fix. And I, and I tell you why, because even if you did get a quick fix, and sometimes we get a massive self-healing surge when we believe in a treatment. Yeah, we think, wow, I found the answer. And we start that treatment and we suddenly get better. And we think, wow, I'm getting better. I'm feeling good. And that in itself switches off defense responses. So then we become on a positive cycle and people find this with different treatments. But then what happens is suddenly they have a dip because they've either overdone it or they've, you know, whatever the reason may be. And they've gone back into those cycles and then they still take that supplement or whatever it may be. But it no longer has that effect because what's happened is they've lost that initial enthusiasm that they had for that particular treatment. So we say in our treatment, you will get better but there will be dips along the way and it's your ability to handle those dips and continue retraining with positivity that eventually get you out of this so we're going to the core of that self-healing process that actually is our birthright you know and um, so that's why for us the minimum commitment of six months now when we say that commitment what that really means is doing some of the core techniques so we don't mean it takes up your entire life (laughs) <laughs> you know, we have people who are working full time who are able to put the tools into practice. But it's that commitment to say, I'm not going to look at any of the theories or worry about this or worry about that. I'm just going to focus on this program to heal myself. And people say, but I want to continue researching and finding solutions. I say, if someone comes up with a cure for fibromyalgia suddenly out of the blue, you'll hear about it. I'll tell you about it. But until then, please just focus on uh, really retraining and um, then you're not swayed by you know all of these million and one theories which uh, which which come up come out this actually sounded to me like an oxymoron because you already have found the solution to this chronic problem mm-hmm. and so when you're saying oh but somebody will find a solution well you have found it well I hope so I hope so 
you know, that would be uh, that would be what yeah. we're looking to do. The, the point I wanted to make, the second one, was that when you said that some of the people didn't succeed or didn't have a full recovery, I speculate that they are dealing with blocking factors. And those would be, for instance, mercury toxicity. That's That was my issue, for example. If you have high level of mercury in your body, especially in the brain, you will have limited success with anything. Mm -hmm. So you need to detoxify that before you can go back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I think the parasympathetic system, when it kicks in, is its own most powerful detoxifier, in my experience. And so we've had people who've been diagnosed with chronic uh, mercury uh, Etc. Um, or some other kind of chemicals, and generally, if they continue with the process, eventually uh, the system is able to come back to normal. That's been our experience. There is a lot of people because actually, there's a lot of people who had mercury fillings, for instance, who had mercury poisoning. Uh, in fact, millions of people. <laughs> and I think what happens is, for me, there are many people who have mercury toxicity but don't go on to have symptoms just as there are many people who have the symptoms but don't have the mercury but i agree with you mercury toxicity potentially could hold someone back from retraining but how and why we don't know yeah right yeah and the second part was you actually guarantee it yeah in terms of until we get a large-scale trial we say use our treatments if it doesn't work for you, after six months, you can return it and have a full refund because we know that patients have limited money. They want to try different treatments. Say, so, hey, try ours. If it doesn't work, you can have your money back. That's, it. that's as simple as it is. And for us, that's very important because ethically, until we get the large scale trial, which definitively proves it, and then we start rolling it out to um, national healthcare systems um, in the US, Canada, and Europe, until that point in time, we want to, that's the way that we want to work. Yeah, so people have got nothing to lose, uh, you know, by giving it, um, giving it that shot. And I think something that I think Martin mentioned earlier, this idea of people thinking it's, you're saying it's all in the mind. I think what we have to get away from is realizing that traditional medical profession has separated psychological conditions and physical conditions. What we're saying is this is a brain condition and the brain and the nervous system connect from here to every single cell and every single order of, order of organ of your body and send the instructions on how to behave and what to do. Therefore, when it's an illness of the nervous system which begins in the brain, the brain also is where we uh, process emotion, process our psychological way of being. We cannot separate the two. It's ridiculous to even try. And the brain says defensive response. So for instance, when we have flu, do we feel happy and uplifted? No. When we have flu, we feel pretty down and lethargic and depressed because the system is using those emotions as a way of making sure we rest and don't do activity. In the same way, when we feel depressed and anxious, we know that those are highly linked to inflammation. So there's a massive amount of inflammation that goes on in the body just because we're feeling depressed. So the idea that we can separate these defensive systems into psychological and physical is completely erroneous. And that is why the traditional medical profession are having difficulties in understanding uh, this condition. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Of course, the other thing with their approach is they, they understand trauma and they can deal with it. They, they are really good at dealing with a, a crisis. What mm -hmm. they're not good at is preventing the crisis from coming up. Exactly. Like the same tool that would be used now let's just say I have cut my arm. I'm totally okay with using a hot iron to cauterize the artery from causing me to bleed. Mm. But that didn't have anything to do with preventing the injury itself. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, there's a preventative aspect of medicine and also the way that medicine deals with chronic long-term conditions which are, don't have a specific identifiable organic cause so in the case of these chronic conditions as i said it's like the hof, the software not the hardware and actually um, i was looking at, on your shelf um at the back you have on your shelf there the book the mind body prescription by uh, dr Sarn john sarno and it's very interesting because i i know that um i don't i haven't actually personally met uh, dr sarno but i know that we have um 
uh, communicated through other people. And he's acknowledged a lot of what I've spoken about, although we have different ways of looking at it, where he believes the condition is caused by repressed emotions, uh, which express themselves as physical symptoms. I believe that repressed emotions might make it more likely that you're going to get uh, trauma in the brain that causes this condition, but I don't believe the, the root factor of it. And in the same way as he tells people to tell the brain to sh shut the hell up or stop it, yes. we use a different uh, process, which is compassionately communicating with the brain and using me meditation. So it's very interesting. There's, there, there are some crossovers, but we are also quite different. But there's a number of different therapists who have noticed that actually when we communicate with these systems, if we do it in the right way, there, there are ways of switching it off. Right. I believe that there's, you're right, there's strong crossover. And he was essentially dealing with the safety valve, the the the, the release mechanism. If, if we can let some of the steam off by allowing the rage that has been repressed to dissipate, then perhaps the reason that's putting the pressure on this cycle on the, on the brain programming can be relieved. And maybe there are some homeostatic mechanisms that would allow us to come back to more normal function once we relieve the pressure. Sure. That's the imagery that I come up with for this. But anyway, whether you, whether you um, retrain it before you relieve the pressure or after you relieve the pressure, either way, through the retraining that you're proposing, you will let go of these stored emotions, the rage and anger. Because once you start doing the process, they do get released. They do. So not only through the specific brain retraining, but also the support of meditation. The so regular meditation is a safe way of letting pressure out of the, um, the pressure cooker. So if you imagine our brain's like a pressure cooker, and the more negative emotions and things we get, it builds up steam. And meditation is like very gently removing the valve at the top when you go, Shh, and you're releasing gradually all that pent up pressure in the brain. And eventually, then the parasympathetic nervous system can begin to kick in once the, that tightness and tension in the system has been released. Precisely. So how do we help people get hold of this? I actually just started a program of webinars that people can join in. So um, if the, the, the webinar that they've missed, they can get a recording and catch up very quickly. And then they can be on this three month of coding from January to March. And yeah, and that's basically how it works. They use some of the DVD information at home, plus they're getting the webinars, they can get to ask questions, and they get support from other people as well. So yeah, people can can start that straight away if, they, if it's of, their, of interest to them. So you have, uh, how many cycles do you start in a year? Uh, we do three cycles. So we do um, uh, January to March, May to uh, July, and September to December. So we have three cycles of the three month process, but people can join at any point and catch up with the recordings of what they've, uh, what they've missed. Yeah, we, we, we wanna feel that it's a very complete package of support because when people have this condition, we know that people feel alone, they feel lonely, they find it difficult to motivate themselves because they just don't have the energy. So step by step, there are small ways of people being able to put tools into practice. Cool. Well, we'll make sure that we have the uh, URL down here along the bottom of the screen when we finish editing this so you can see it. And it'll also be in the comments and or descriptions, depending on if you see this on our YouTube page or if you see it on our Facebook page. And uh, Ashok, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to share this amazing information with us and with uh, all of our tribe. And it's been absolutely uh, enlightening as far as I'm concerned. Uh, before we go, could you leave everybody with just like one tip? We hear these stories each day at our clinic and it's so satisfying, rewarding to hear that. And I think the number one thing is recognizing that the way you feel right now is an artificial feeling. So a lot of people who have fibromyalgia feel that sense of despair, that anxiety, the feeling that I can't move forward in life. But that's simply because the levels of serotonin the levels of dopamine and the levels of oxytocin, all these feel good chemicals are very low in the brain. So you might be feeling down, feeling this dark cloud hanging over you, but it's an artificial uh, environment in the brain, which can make you feel like nothing's gonna work, I'm not going to get better. 
the thing I would like to leave everyone with is, is to recognize that that's not real. And actually, when we focus on the positivity and that moving forward, that yes, it is my birthright to have health and happiness. It's my birthright to be able to move forward and heal my body, heal my brain. Then with that positivity, whatever treatment we try, is going to be more effective for us. And that's the, the hope that I want to give back to everyone. We can heal from this condition. And there's a very logical reason why it's here. And before we go, I almost forgot. Martin, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and uh, get some health coaching advice and, and see how they can maybe use some supplementation or some other uh, food products to support this, how can they get a hold of you? Yes, indeed. You can find us at www.life-enthusiast.com by phone at 866-543-3388. Uh, we are generally available. Give us a call. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you as well. And we hope you join us next time. You've been watching or listening to the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet.